All right, y'all, you're locked on Falcons. I'm your host, Aaron Freeman, and today is a Labor Day Monday mailbag where I will be answering your listener questions, including on some of you think Desmond Ritter should start week one, and I'll be making the case why that doesn't make any sense in my eyes. You are locked on Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, you know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, a.k.a. Sirius Black, a.k.a. Mr. Drew, a.k.a. your very humble host of this Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family. And today's episode of Locked On Falcons is presented by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their prize picks projections, you can win up to 10 times your money on your entry. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code Locked On. That's prizepicks.com, promo code Locked On. So, guys, we thank everyone that makes Locked On Falcons their first listen each and every day. Of course, Locked On Falcons is free and available Monday through Friday on a variety of podcast platforms, including Apple, Odyssey, Google, Spotify, and, of course, YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to Locked On Falcons on YouTube. Hit that bell. Hit give us a like. And when you do, you'll get the video version of the podcast the night before the audio drops. So today we're answering many of the leftover mailbag questions that most of you guys submitted on Thursday and Friday. Uh, and, you know, we'll talk a lot about the roster stuff. Uh, a lot of you guys are curious about, you know, how the IR works, which guys can get elevated from the practice squad, why this guy was added, if we'll see this guy, who's going to be inactive. So we'll get into all of that on today's episode, but we'll start off uh, answering a, a pair of listener questions that are related. Uh, one comes from young Zach who asks, why not start Ritter week one and see what you have with him? Worst case scenario is we'll have a top three pick next year. And Eddie Robbins on Twitter asks, we have nothing to lose by letting Ritter take over now or in a few weeks. It gives him experience. Let's see what we have. So I would disagree with this notion. I think the worst case scenario is that you ruin your quarterback. You don't have many bites at this apple, guys. And, you know, basically wasting one uh, by throwing Ritter to the wolves does not make a ton of sense. Now, you know, I think part of this notion is due to a, I think, a false assumption, a false narrative that uh, the Falcons, should they have this top three pick, as, as Eddie puts it, you know, will have an opportunity to get a better quarterback next year. And I, again, I, as I tried to explain on Friday's Q&A, um, that that to me is based off of a very false assumption, whether it's Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, Anthony Richardson, Will Levis, Tyler Van Dyke, whoever that quarterback is, that any one of those guys, should they become available, are, are going to be these can't miss sort of prospects. That's kind of a false notion. No one really knows what these upcoming crop of quarterbacks really is going to be, especially this time of year and then even then even if one of one or more of those guys are this sort of can't miss all world prospect you're not guaranteed to get that guy even with the top three pick let's say you know you get the third overall selection and it's a two quarterback draft and there's a big drop off from two to three and the two quarterbacks go one two and then what are you doing and if you've ruined desmond ritter in, in the process now you're you know sol as they say so I feel like the best case scenario for the Falcons is developing Ritter and getting a top three pick. Uh, and I know the perception, as I discussed on Friday's episode, is that those two things are mutually excused. They can't coexist. They can. Um, they're not. It's not common, but it's certainly to me, if we're shooting for what the best case scenario, take care of business uh, with Desmond Ritter and try to do your best to develop him today because you can control that. And don't worry about the things that you can't control, like where you're going to be picking in the draft and who's going to be available next year. Let that all play out when it plays out. Um, you know, for me, I doesn't I don't see the upside. I don't see the rush to get Ritter on the field. Right. If you're asking me how many games does Ritter need to start for you to get a fair evaluation of him, I would say it's probably like seven or eight. Right. You know, if, if you're getting more than that, the only real ups, like, you know, seven or eight games, you'll probably get about 200, 250, 300 uh, pass attempts. Uh, I feel like that's a good enough number to figure out if you have something. 
um, you know, getting him 500 pass attempts by having him start the entire season. Um, to me, the only benefit of getting that extra 500, you know, the extra 200 over 300 or so pass attempts is only if the player is good. Um, and so like, you know, again, I know there's differing expectations on whether or not Ritter or the team will be good, but I just don't get the the rush to have to see him on the field. Right. Yeah. You know, I feel like there's a sweet spot between somewhere between week six and week 10 that he'll get his starts, you know, by veterans day, we will see Desmond Ritter be the starter again. I know there'll be some pushback and some disagreement there, but I, I don't feel like there's any rush to get him on the field, especially when you consider who the Falcons are facing in those first couple of games. Again, I've pointed out to the guy behind me on the poster behind me, Aaron Donald, many a time, I, I just don't see what is to gain, right? What's the upside? What's the best case scenario where Desmond Ritter is getting decapitated by Aaron Donald in week two? Uh, you know, you look at PFF's D-line rankings going into the season. The Falcons face seven out of the top eight teams in those D-line rankings. The only team in the top eight on PFF's D-line rankings that they don't have on their schedule this year is Green Bay, right? The other seven teams they face on their schedule. And guess what? Four out of their first six games are against those top eight D-lines, right? This is what I mean, guys. We're, we're, we're throwing whoever's the starting week one to the Wolves behind a very questionable offensive line, behind what is probably going to be a bottom five to bottom 10 offensive line against some of the best D-lines in the league, that to me is not a good scenario. How is Desmond Ritter going to benefit from having to run from his life, run for his life, being torn apart by wolves with ba basically a stick to protect himself, to continue the analogy? All right, you're chumming the waters, and there's sharks in these waters, and you're like, throw the rookie into the water and say, hey, I hope you, I hope you swim, and we'll figure it out. You know, like, I just don't see what the benefit of that why there is this rush to get him on the field what's the upside of that um you know again i'm sure some of it is related to the idea of tanking which you know i get but you also understand like you know it's not rational to expect the team to, to, to act actively tank again this i've said this before this is the one season where i think you can make an an argument where it would be beneficial for the team to tank but at the same time like it's not rational to actually expect a a, a a group of individuals that their their job is to win football games to not do their job, right? Like it's the same thing. The analogy I would use is like it's thinking firefighters whose job is to put out fires and getting mad at firefighters for not starting more fires, right? You can make the weird twisted logic of, hey, if you're a firefighter and you start more fires, you'll be able to put out more fires, right? Just like the idea of, hey, if we lose now, we'll win more in the long run. Right. It's that sort of dark, twisted logic. But like you couldn't go up to a public town hall and be like, hey, uh, Mr. Mayor, city council, I push for a motion for us to, you know, be more arson related, more arson related laws. And we need to start more fires so that we can get more usage out of our fire department. They will usher you out of that room and probably lock you up. It's not a rational opinion is the point I'm trying to make. So like you can you can hold that opinion deep in the dark recesses and, and secretly be an arsonist if you want to continue the metaphor and the analogy, guys. But like you, you can't go out publicly and, and declare, hey, we should be starting more fires. Hey, you know, you guys should be tanking like they're not going to do that. Like that's so like you can sit here and, and want to believe that they should tank. You know, I secretly hold that dark, twisted <laughs> fantasy. Right. But like, you know, like it, it's not something that you can really advocate uh, the team to actually do. Right. Um, so like, I just don't see what the upside is of starting Desmond Ritter and throwing him to the wolves early in the season. I don't see what you benefit from that other. Oh, he gets more reps, but he's going to be running for his life. Right. And he's going to be probably running for his life against it behind a bad offensive line without a lot of supporting cast. Right. And, and again, I know there's going to be disagreement on, you know, how good this team is going to be, but like for me, it boils down to hoping for the best, hoping for this great outcome, guys, hoping that this rebuild is going to be quick. And within a year or two, we're going to be in the playoffs and winning playoff games. You can hope for that all you want, but I'm going to sit here and be honest with you guys. You should expect that not to happen. You should expect that rather than a one or two year rebuild, that this is going to be a three, four or five year rebuild, if not longer. And you should expect a, a long drawn out process. So like that to me kind of summarizes this whole situation with should Ritter start like, yeah, you can expect to throw him out to the wolves. You can hope that you can throw him out to the wolves week one. And he's going to go out there and cook the saints. And he's going to cook the, the Rams and do all this stuff. And, and you're going to be like, Oh my God, Desmond Ritter is the greatest quarterback of all time, but don't expect that. Right. So that's kind of where I'm at guys. Like I, it's, I don't see the upside of starting him right away. My point is like, just be patient. Like, that's kind of the, the theme of not only Desmond Ritter in his development, but also this Falcon team. Like, I think you guys should plan to be patient, 
hope for the best, hope for, you know, immediate return on your investment, but plan to be patient. Don't plan for this thing to, to suddenly get fixed overnight. So that's kind of how I feel about it. Um, I'm sure many of you will uh, express your opinions and your dissenting or agreements uh, in the comments below. By all means, do so. Uh, hit me up on Twitter and, and send me an email at Locked on Falcons uh, to let me locked on Falcons at mail.com to let me know why you agree or disagree on that notion. But I just don't see the what's the upside of rushing him. Um, you know, that notion that there's no downside or, or is, you know, there's no worst case scenario or something or whatever. Uh, I, I don't really agree with that, but we'll let that go. And we'll get into the rest of the listener questions, including a lot of talk about the roster, a lot of talk about inactives, whether or not we're going to see Anthony Ferkser on the field come week one. We'll get into all of that, guys, uh, as we continue today's episode. But first, I want to tell you about Prize Picks, a new fun way to play daily fantasy. All you got to do is pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their Prize Picks uh, projections, you can win. I already put my three in for week one. I got Kyle Pitts having more than 55.5 receiving yards marcus mariota having more than 210.5 passing yards i also got josh allen having more than 275.5 passing yards in the thursday night kickoff game i'm being optimistic despite all the things i just said we be optimistic that some of these guys are going to exceed their projections in week one and the thing i love about prize picks is it's not me going up against other people it's just me versus the projections they're more they're less then you know I can win, and it's not just NFL; it's NBA, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, and more. Prize Picks is safe, it's fast, it's easy, and currently in operation in 30 states uh, in the U.S. and Canada. All you got to do is download the Prize Picks app or go to PrizePicks.com and sign up to play daily fantasy sports. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code Locked On. That means if you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you another $100. Don't forget to use that promo code locked on L O C K E D O N at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. So, guys, uh, before we continue today's episode with our listener QA on this uh, illustrious Labor Day Monday, uh, make sure you subscribe if you haven't subscribed to Locked On Falcons on YouTube. Make sure you give us a five star rating in Apple or iTunes or, or wherever you want to rate us. Uh, that all helps the podcast in addition. Um, to all the support that you guys give us on a daily basis by making us your first listen each and every day. So let's get into our next question. It's from TD at NFL Falcons TD. Uh, with current 53 players, who do you expect to be inactive on game day most weeks? So, um, you know, this is the height of my roster nerddom. Um, but, you know, typically you'll have five inactive players each and every week to make the 48-man roster. Um, it, typically you'll get one offensive lineman, Week one, that might be Chuma Adoga, uh, just because he's still kind of get up to speed in, in the offense. But I think eventually the Falcons would like to, him to be the swing tackle. So that would potentially lead to Kobe Gossett or even Jermaine Effetti being inactive uh, as the year progresses uh, at as that one offensive lineman. Usually the team has five active D linemen. Uh, and they have six currently on the roster. So that's probably going to be Matt Dickerson or uh, Timmy Horn. Uh, early in the season, they might decide to activate all of those guys. Um, and that would probably mean that more than one linebacker will be inactive. My guess would be Nate Landman is probably the least likely player to be active. Usually they keep eight or nine uh, linebackers and, and edge rushers active on game day. Uh, you know, Landman would be guy number 10. Uh, Quentin Bell would probably be guy number nine. So those two guys uh, are probably most in danger, but probably early in the season, particularly if they go with five active D linemen, uh, it'll probably be Landman. Um, there's probably a wide receiver. They usually have five active wide receivers each week. So wide receiver six, if we're assuming that's going to be Jared Bernhardt, that's probably who's going to be inactive. There may be a day where, you know, maybe they, Bernhard is able to leapfrog someone like a Demir Bird uh, in that regard uh, to be the inactive guy. And then probably the fifth spot would most likely be Felipe Franks. However, what's interesting about Felipe Franks is currently the Falcons only have two and a half tight ends on the roster. If we count Franks as a half tight end, half quarterback, uh, usually they have three active tight ends on game day. And so I would be, and I've said this before, I would be surprised if that third tight end is Felipe Franks come week one, 
Um, and so I do kind of expect the team to promote one of their tight ends from their practice squad to be that third tight end. And then that would leave Franks to be that fifth inactive on game day. Uh, and that kind of leads us into our next question from Gates at the Gent 28 on Twitter. Um, he asked, Ferkser it ha has been mentioned as a guy to bring back. Why is it taking so long for the organization to put Fitzpatrick on the roster slash bring back Ferk? Is it maybe an indication that he won't be brought back after all? And then chill, catch vibes on Twitter. As, so how much of a chance is Ferkser active versus the Saints somehow? So um, as I've discussed already, you know, I, I kind of expect – a third tight end to be activated off the practice squad, you know, given the Falcons have like three practice squad tight ends uh, in addition to, you know, John Fitzpatrick being on injured reserve for at least the first four weeks. Um, you know, so I expect one of these guys to come in game day and be the third tight end active on game day. Now what's the interesting wrinkle with that is, you know, promoting one of those guys off of the practice squad. Normally you would have to cut somebody off your 53 man roster in order to create that caps, that, that, roster spot for that promotion but the wrinkle is that nowadays thanks to the covid uh protocols that the league put in two years ago you can promote two practice practice squad players uh like you know the day of the game or the day before the game without having to have to cut a guy to create a roster spot and so that's a kind of an out for the falcons to get one or more of these tight ends whether it's Ferks or whether it's michael pruitt P particularly you know michael pruitt makes sense if Ferkser's ankle injury that he suffered in the preseason finale against the jaguars is enough to keep him limited in practice and that may be a reason why the falcons are putting him on the practice squad initially rather than keeping a roster spot on him but i would expect one of these two guys Ferkser, michael pruitt of course tucker fisk is also on the practice squad but i you know given that the falcons already cut him once this summer before bringing him back T suggests to me uh, that he's probably not top of the hierarchy as, as far as tight end promotions go. So I do expect in the next couple of days, uh, at some point, we will see one of these guys get promoted. But if it doesn't happen, don't be surprised if you, you know, scrolling through Twitter, or you're reading through your your Falcons news feed and you see, hey, the Falcons activated Michael Pruitt or and or Anthony Ferkser, uh, as well as maybe another player uh, to be those two sort of practice squad game day promotions uh, for this upcoming Sunday's matchup against the Saints. So we'll see about that. And of course, we still have more questions to get into guys on today's episode, including who's going to be the starting wide receivers, which free agent D tackle Sheldon Richardson or Indomitian Sue could help this team the most. And could we see AJ McCarron returning to this team in a practice squad role? And we'll get into all of that as we continue today's episode. But before we do, guys, I thank you for making Locked On Falcons your first listen. But I always recommend your second listen be Locked On Sports Atlanta, where you can find three shows all in the same podcast feed, where four hosts, A to Z's, uh, Mark Zeno's A to Z, John Chuckery's hitting hard, and Jarvis Davis and Tanitra Batiste on ATL Day Ones, breaking down not only local sports, but national sports. And of course, Locked On Sports Atlanta on YouTube is also the place for the Locked On Braves and Locked On Falcons postcast. Jarvis and I on the Locked On Falcons postcast will be breaking down every Falcons win, loss, and tie this season on YouTube on Locked On Sports Atlanta. So make sure you subscribe to Locked On Sports Atlanta on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. So our next question, guys, comes from White Hastings, 17 on Twitter. He asks, who will be the starting wide receivers week one, assuming London is active? I would expect London and Edwards to be the two starting receivers. I would expect the Zacchaeus to get a lot of those third wide receiver reps uh, when the Falcons go to their 11 personnel or their three wide receiver sets. I think it's notable that Zacchaeus spent about 60% of his preseason snaps playing in the slot. Uh, and if that carries over into the regular season, that'll be interesting. And the reason why it's interesting is because I've long advocated for Zacchaeus being primarily a slot receiver because I feel like he has Cole Beasley-esque ability in, in that role, but as an outside receiver, which is, I think, part of the reason why he hasn't quite lived up uh, to these lofty expectations these last couple of years when he's gotten opportunities because he's been primarily an outside receiver. Um, you know, I feel like playing him in the slot is the best usage of his skill set. And I kind of gave up on that dream after last season. I'm like, oh, well, I guess that dream's over. Uh, but now it seems like it may finally be happening. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing if that leads to, um, you know, Zacchaeus having that sort of, uh, you know, career best breakout type of season for him. Uh, G at 54, yo thoughts, asks if the Falcons could sign any one of these remaining free agents, who would it make the roster better? He lists uh, Eric Fisher, the left tackle, defensive tackle, Sheldon Richardson, defensive tackle, and Dominican Sue, defensive end, Jason Pierre-Paul, and safety, Landon 
Collins. And so, yes, if the Falcons were to sign any of those guys, it would make them a better team. Now, I'm sure you're wondering sort of which of that group I would advocate for the Falcons to sign. I would probably pick Sheldon Richardson just because I think it's going to give you the most juice as a pass rusher uh, among that group. And I think that's going to benefit your team more than anything else. Uh, Big Ballin at Big Ballin Int 100 on Twitter asked, did the offensive line we got from the Jets make Leroy Watson expendable? No, Leroy Watson was already expendable because of the Tyler Vrabel uh, signing in undrafted free agency. There was no world where, you know, due to Arthur Smith's love affair with Tyler's dad, Mike, that he was going to cut his son. So Tyler Vrabel was already locked in to a practice squad spot, even though I do think Leroy Watson, to me, at least to my eyes, was a lot more impressive and has a lot more upside than Tyler Vrabel as a developmental tackle, just because of the the upside that he has as an athlete uh, from being a converted tight end uh, to play in this outside zone scheme with that sort of movement and ability that he has there. Uh, but we'll we'll see what Tyler Vrabel brings to the table. I don't think Chuma Adoga really has much to do with that. I don't think Leroy Watson was really a threat to be the Falcons' uh, primary swing tackle like Chuma Adoga has the potential to be, just given Watson is new to the position, looked like a player that was new to the position. He's a developmental project, uh, so he wasn't necessarily going to be the guy that you penciled in to be Jake Matthews' backup in the event of an injury. Uh, at Ski Shepherd uh, or at Johannes Butel on Twitter asks, um, will... Abdullah Anderson being back, do you think Marlon Davidson will be done? Um, I think Anderson is more depth behind Anthony Rush, given that Anderson spent a lot of time playing nose tackle uh, this summer, while Davidson is obviously much more of a 3-4 defensive end, and that's really where Matt Dickerson and Timmy Horn are likely to play. So I think those two guys' performances is much more a threat to Marlon Davidson's status when he gets off the the injury reserve. If those two guys have a good September, um, then that would put Marlon Davidson's roster status in jeopardy, uh, more so than Abdullah Anderson. Um, At Mark Reimers 5, ask a question similar to what Johannes's uh, follow-up question is. Johannes' question is, are they gonna sign? Are they gonna sign a practice squad quarterback, i.e., Kellerman or AJ McCarron? And Mark asked, "Do you think we sign another quarterback, or do you think we just roll with Ritter and Franks?" So, um, Mond did sign with the Browns. Um, I don't think a quarterback signing is imminent. Uh, it wouldn't shock me if the Falcons worked out a couple of guys just to have some options. Uh, and, and AJ McCarron makes a ton of sense. Uh, I think the only likely outcome where the Falcons add a quarterback is if there's an injury to Marcus. Mariota, um, and then you bring in somebody that week that you think can be ready to go in the event that you need, you know, a, another option. And I think AJ McCarron makes a ton of sense just because he's familiar with the offense and the scheme from last summer. Um, and he's still out there. He worked out with the Browns back in July, back when they worked out Josh Rosen and others. Obviously, Rosen ultimately uh, was signed and, and then wound up being cut for Kellen Maul and Small World uh, in that regard. All these Browns cast offs is probably where the Falcons will wind up. Um, Marco at Marco in touch on Twitter asks, how good of a backup do you think Ritter will be for Young or Stroud? No, I actually think Young will be a, a great backup for Desmond Ritter. Stroud, nah. Not so so much sold on his uh, upside for a uh, backup quarterback position, but I do think Ritter is likely to be the Falcon starter. If you missed Friday's episode, uh, you can listen to me uh, explain why I think that on the last episode of the podcast. But uh, let's move on to young Zach's other question. He asked, does a player have to be injured to be placed on injured reserve? I believe that's the way it works. Um, I don't know the exact rules. I haven't read the entire collective bargaining agreement. Um I would imagine, you know, the league would prohibit teams from putting healthy players on injured reserve. Uh, Now, I think the question is the severity of an injury may not necessarily be something where it has to be a a major injury for a player to go on injured reserve. Typically, you know, let's use an example of like Deion Jones, right? Like, let's say Deion Jones's injury, given that he he actually played not too long ago, uh, is not really a long term injury. Uh, let's say it's an injury that normally would maybe keep him out of the lineup limited or uh, not practicing for two weeks or whatever. And you put him on the IR and now he's out for at least four weeks due to the short term IR. Now, under normal circumstances, an NFL team probably wouldn't do that because they want their players to come back and play as soon as possible. Uh, but in the specific case of Deion Jones, as I've explained many t- times over the last uh, three, four months, 
I don't think the Falcons are in that boat. I don't think the Falcons are in any rush for Deion Jones uh, to suit up for the team anytime soon uh, and would much rather see him not play another snap. And so I think that's kind of their, you know, I don't know what conversations they're having or anything like that, but uh, to me is, you know, reason number 86 uh, that I've expressed over the last couple of months, why, you know, the, the Deion Jones Atlanta Falcons relationship is headed for divorce divorce. They're already separated at this point in time to continue an analogy. Uh, you just, you just kind of like, okay, are we going to file for this divorce? Are we going to sign the papers and just, you know, make it official? Or are we just going to do this sort of pretend that we're like, Oh, we really like it. You know, that's kind of how I feel about it. But uh, I think that's how it works at, um, Africanism, uh, aka Bong on Twitter, he asks, given the Falcons are set for a massive windfall next year, which players are on the roster do you foresee getting big contracts to keep them with the team? Um, in terms of big contracts, we're talking like 10 million a year or more. Chris Lindstrom's probably due up this upcoming offseason. He's got a fifth year option. So that means 2023 is the final year of his contract. You probably want to get that deal done uh, before uh, the season starts. Um, then you have AJ Terrell, potentially. That could happen as early as next offseason, or the Falcons could wait. Um, you know, I think you probably there's a justification for wanting to get it done next off season before, uh, the, the 2023 season, uh, so that, you know, that contract doesn't continue to balloon, um, you know, with the market for cornerbacks only likely to go up. Uh, so you want to get that deal done. And then after that, of course, Kyle Pitts would be next on the docket. Pitts is not technically eligible to get an extension until after the 2023 season so the 2024 offseason that's when you can first start talking to him about an extension it's three years for those first round picks after three years they've been on the team um and we'll, we'll see about that right you know um and then i think when you're talking about impending free agents um you know like the guys that are going to hit free agency next year the top of the the, the list for the falcons will be Caleb mcgarry lorenzo carter alarm and azikias rashawn evans isaiah oliver um maybe somebody else emerges maybe an abdullah anderson you know comes out of nowhere but um you know of that group you know whether or not they get um you know, second deals with the Falcons next off season will be entirely dependent on how they perform this upcoming season. Uh, our last question comes from dirty bird digest on Twitter. He asked, will Ridley be a Falcon in 2023? Will Terry Fontenot sell low on a star receiver or keep him? Uh, I don't think Ridley will be a Falcon in 2023. I've said since he got suspended that I think the Falcons will move on from him at their earliest convenience, which will probably be when he is reinstated. That will either be him being traded. Uh, if a trade, you know, is, if they can find a trade partner, which is not a foregone conclusion. And if not, then they will probably wind up releasing him. But I think Ridley's days in Atlanta are done. Uh, but we'll see. Again, it's a non-zero chance that he's back. But I think it's probably like a 1.2% chance that he's back. But then again, I think I said someone, the Falcons trading Matt Ryan, I think was like a 1.2% chance or something like that. Uh, and I wound up being wrong in that. So we'll see, right? You know, it won't be the first time I've been wrong. It'll just be the fifth time I've ever been wrong about something related to the Falcons. So that's it, guys. That's it. We're done with our questions and answers. Uh, tomorrow's episode, we will be getting into my season preview. I've figured out the schedule for this upcoming week uh, and we'll be giving you my season preview. I'll be giving you my projections for the season. I'll be giving you my official win-loss predictions as well later in the week we'll be joined by some guests to give their thoughts on the upcoming season um then we'll have a crossover thursday with ross jackson of locked on saints then friday we'll have jarvis davis of the atl day ones podcast to help us preview this week one matchup with the saints and get jarvis's thoughts on that and you know this will be kind of the last week where we, we next week after the week one game we'll get into our sort of regular schedule you know sunday evenings uh, you can check out the Locked On uh, Falcons postcast on the Locked On Sports Atlanta uh, after the game. That will usually drop within 10 minutes after the final whistle on Locked On Sports Atlanta. Of course, later on Locked On Falcons, usually Sunday evenings, you will see me give you my full rapid reaction, which will count as the Monday audio episode. Then the next day, we'll usually have a guest uh, to recap whatever the recent game was. Then Wednesday will be our All-22 review. That will be another opportunity for you guys to submit your q a and, and mailbag questions thursdays of course will be crossover thursdays and then friday jarvis will probably be a regular guest 
on Friday throughout the season to get, sort of give us that final weekend uh, preview wrap up and whatnot. And that's going to be our normal schedule. Obviously, there will be weeks where we'll have to sort of move stuff around, given you know Thursday night games and Saturday games and all this stuff. But generally, that's going to be the general trend we'll follow throughout the season. Uh, so you can look forward to that. You can also look forward to, you know, not only checking out Locked On Sports Atlanta, Locked On Hawks, Locked On Braves, Locked On Bulldogs as your second list. And of course, check out Locked On Bulldogs uh, to see, uh, you know, Clinton Daniel crowing about the beatdown that uh, uh, they put on Oregon on uh, Saturday. My God, um, you know, Jalen Carter. But um, you can also check out uh, as your second listen, the ultimate football preview, right? That's running all week long on the Locked On Network, where experts like myself will be joining. We'll be doing NFC South later this week, uh, if you're missing it. But it's been part of an eight-episode extravaganza that started last week, continuing this week. All you got to do is search for Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022 on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. So, guys, that's it. Really appreciate it. Till then.